Thanks for joining us live for Convocation uh, this morning. We actually are coming to you for the entire time live. And we wanted to start uh, before we have our time of worship with just a few minutes with one of our great leaders in OSD, Audrey Hammond with LU Send. Uh, Audrey is, uh, used to be with the academic side of the world, but then she came into LU Send to really build out so much of what we have offered to you. Um, Obviously, during this pandemic season, uh, we've had so many challenges, including global travel, mm -hmm. uh, but yet you guys have uh, not taken your foot off the pedal. You're continuing to yeah. offer travel experiences, probably more domestic than we've ever done, mm -hmm. coming, uh, coming up at spring break and Christmas break, but yet um, maybe some different kind of experiences with international. But I wanted you, if you would, Audrey, to talk to us about Semester Abroad. You built out that program for us, mm -hmm. and it's been thriving. But uh, tell us a little bit about opportunities uh, right now with uh, Semester Abroad. Yeah, things definitely do uh, look a little different than they used to a study abroad, but really the purpose and the benefit behind study abroad has remained the same. And so um, we have really worked um, hard with our partners. We work with uh, schools and partners in over 75 countries to bring students as many options and opportunities uh, to study abroad as we can, even during um, this pandemic season. And so uh, we really, we're working with schools um, that really are doing what Liberty's doing. We're, we're working hard to, uh, you know, stay uh, within the government guidelines, whatever country that may be, to make sure students are safe and taken care of. And so, uh, you know, a student can, can go almost anywhere um, studying abroad right now. I mean, uh, with on a student visa, almost every country is letting students in um, to study abroad. And so we, you get there, um, the school will help you do the two week quarantine, required quarantine, and after that, you live like a local for the next four months. And so it really, um, you know, you're gonna feel like a regular college student going around town, going to classes. Yeah. And so it's, it's just like Liberty's preparing for our students. They're preparing the same for both their local students and international students as well. So for the 4,000 plus freshmen that just walked into this place, yeah. or maybe even some of our online students, because mm -hmm. a lot of our online students uh, take advantage of the study abroad program yeah, you've created. Talk to us about what study abroad is it's, it's, and, and some of the benefits uh, yeah. of, of, of having that in your college resume when you're out there looking for a job later. Yeah, it's so important. And so um, there's a couple different things. We, there's traditional study abroad where you go and you study at another institution uh, and we transfer those credits back to Liberty. And then also uh, there's international internships. You know, some people um, have a hard time studying abroad, but they can do an international internship. And so really we've worked hard to create so many options for students that everybody can do it. Um, there's, there's not a student at Liberty that couldn't study abroad if they wanted to or do an international internship. These signature uh, mm -hmm. experiences that you crafted with our team there. Uh, tell them about that, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, so we're starting to create signature programs. So far we have two, but more coming down the line. Um, and so the two that we have now are Ecuador and Italy. And so what makes those really special is that um, the signature programs, we've worked um, really hard with those uh, local professors. And so students get Liberty University credit for it. And uh, they also can use all of their financial aid. So regular traditional study abroad, you can use any outside financial aid, any outside student loans, but Liberty Given Aid can be used for these signature programs. So you really spend the exact same amount as you would with being a residential student here at Liberty, living overseas in Ecuador for the semester. And uh, you pay exactly as you would living on campus. So, I mean, you've got a lot of different nations. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in a meeting yesterday and I was blown away by all these even maybe closed nations yeah. that are giving access and visas for study abroad right. that you've developed. Uh, and you were telling us how it's actually one of the safest routes to be uh, you know, a student in the world. Like so, to like reverse that, if a student is coming from, from Ecuador to us mm -hmm. or from Italy to us, uh, and they're a Liberty student for a semester studying abroad, right. we would afford them all the safety that we give every student here, all these different things, and then some. Uh, so talk to us about like Italy, for example. Mm -hmm. That's one of our signature yep. places. The world knows Italy as a place that saw the pandemic really hit yeah. at the hardest level. Now, at this point, they're one of the safer nations later on, but mm -hmm. s let's say I send my child there mm -hmm. and, um, God forbid, things begin to elevate again. The numbers start ticking back up again. Uh, what's our plan? 
Yeah, our, um, we have really great relationships with our partners. We don't send students anywhere where we can't pick up the phone and have a decision made and students home within like 48 hours. And right. so um, we can absolutely, we've done it before, we can absolutely do it again. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, obviously, hopefully it wouldn't get to that, but, um, but if we need to, um, we can have students back in the country um, as quickly as, like I said, 48 hours. So, yeah. um, but our partners are well versed in our expectations and also governmental expectations in each country on how to protect students. And so, like I said, just like Liberty um, would afford the same care to an international student as we would all of our residential students, they're doing the same thing. You actually did it last time when mm -hmm. in February uh, the pandemic started to like just become something very quickly, very global. Yeah. You got everyone home fast mm -hmm. and safe. And we again, it was such a testament of your great work. And then the way that we built out this program to be safe, uh, you know, with Teradata and all these different components that you have. So thankful for you. I know Thanks. it's a weird, difficult season for all of us, especially for those of you that do all of our travel. I just feel safer knowing that you guys are every day working so hard to make these experiences all that they can be uh, for our students. As Christians, we feel even more compelled to go yeah. because you're not just going to Rome, Italy to study or going to Ecuador to study. You're being salt and light and you're literally being missional uh, and you know, carrying, carrying out the Great Commission. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, no problem. Let, me, let me pray for us and then we'll start our time of worship. Father, we thank you for this morning, your mercies that are always made new. And now God, as we sing to you, we pray that our time of worship uh, would be pleasing God to you. We, um, we don't have to do this, we get to do this. We get to ascribe to you, God, uh, that you really are the God of this universe. We sing all of us from different dorms and different apartment complexes, uh, God, here in this live audience, these same words so that we're united, God, in, at the foot of the cross and making much of you. We pray this in your name, amen. Good morning, Liberty. Let's stand up and worship together. We're going to ascribe praise to the Lamb of God, His perfect sacrifice. You are holy. You came from heaven's throne. Acquainted with our sorrow. To train the dead. Your suffering for our freedom. Hallelujah. The Lamb of God in my place. His blood poured out my sin. He rest. He was my death. You died. I am raised to And the powers, the power of sin, the done. We no longer have to live in bondage. Yes, for my salvation.
Welcome to Convo today. Yes, there's no greater love than God's love for us. And of course, one of the famous verses is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's bow our heads together for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for loving us. We thank you for sending your Son into this world. We thank you today, dear Lord Jesus, that you came. Lord, you allowed them to nail you to that cross. You took our sins, Lord, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could one day spend eternity with you. And if there's one watching today that's never become a believer, never become a follower of you, never accepted you into their heart and life as their personal Savior. I pray this would be the day that they would do it so that we could see them in heaven one day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, tomorrow, September the 26th, it's a great day because we're going to Washington, D.C. to join Franklin Graham for a prayer march. And we have over 2,000 of you as students that are going to go with us. Now, it's raining outside right now, but in the morning it may be raining too. But when you get up in the morning, if it's raining, you come and get on those buses because we're told it's not going to be raining by the time we get there. And besides that, we're going to have breakfast for you. We're going to have lunch. And then we're going to supply you with dinner. So, you know, if, even if it's raining, it doesn't hurt us being able to eat. So I want you that are not able to go, uh, I want you to uh, be praying. You may not, we've actually limited out on buses to go, so uh, maybe you're not going to be able to go and you wanted to, but you can pray. We're going to be doing that march between 12 and 2 o'clock on Saturday. And then tomorrow's another special event. Uh, we're going to have our first home football game here at 1 o'clock. That's going to be an exciting time. I hope you'll come and be a part of that. And so today is also an exciting day. It's exciting because we have a special guest here today, a guest that I've known as a pastor, as an evangelist that's traveled across this country preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and thousands have come to Christ because of his love for lost people, his love to present the gospel to them. And he's involved in a lot of other things that Pastor David is going to tell about as he comes to introduce our special guest today. Pastor David, let's welcome him today as he comes. Thank you, Dr. Prevo. Appreciate you, sir. I was, uh, I was 18 years old and had just become a believer. And uh, to be very honest, uh, my father uh, was not a Christian. And so coming from uh, a Middle Eastern background, uh, God just brought this man, our guest today, into my life as a father figure. I'll never forget uh, the very first time that I went to a crusade. It was a J-Strat crusade. And I walked into a Coliseum with about 25,000 people and sat in the very, very back of that Coliseum and watched someone get up and just communicate on a youth night the gospel in a way that I just didn't know could be uh, delivered at that level. And then by the end of the night, I watched literally hundreds of people walk the aisle and give their life to Christ at, a, at the end of the gospel presentation. And, and I looked at my friend who had invited me and I said, what is this? And he said, this is called a crusade. He said, Dr. Strack does the second biggest ones in the world. And there's this man named Billy Graham. I'd never heard of him who does the big ones. As much as this is like 25,000 people, Billy Graham does them with like 100,000 people, you know, in the biggest stadiums of the world. And, and what I was really interested in wasn't necessarily the context, but the opportunity to bring people together and then have someone open God's word, point to the good news, and then offer it to them in real time. And I think, uh, looking back, that is a moment in my life, a pivotal moment in my life where I watched you, Dr. J, present the gospel, and I knew I'm made for the same thing. I remember watching you share the gospel and thinking to myself, wow, I want to do that for the rest of my life. I, this is too good to keep to myself, but God has done in my life, and I want people to know that. Little did I know at that moment that uh, God was going to actually open up a relationship with an instant hero in my life in Dr. J. 
He found out that I was just this young kid who was getting going in ministry and had a call of evangelism on my life. And, and he just took me in. Uh, one of the busiest people in the world. Uh, he's authored 26 books. He's edited three Bibles, one of them the Transformer Bible, which is one of the most successful Bibles in print history. And uh, this, this incredibly uh, you know, busy man just took time to just bring me under his wing. And became a dad to me. And I traveled around the country and I sold those books for you at the book table. But he would let me go to school assemblies. And, and sometimes he'd bring me out in front of a crowd and say, tell them what God has done in your life. And, and little by little, uh, we traveled the country and he would just teach me. And I can't tell you how often late at night after a crusade, we'd sit there and he would take three hours and let me ask questions about the Bible. Take two hours and teach me about just different things uh, out of God's word on, on doctrine. And more than anything else, just continues to be present in my life. I can tell you there's not one decision I make in my life, not one, tr one crossroad moment, one intersection moment in my life where I don't go to this man for wisdom uh, and I don't go to him to, to ask, like, what do you think, Dr. J? You know, this is what's going on. It's bigger than me. Uh, I, I, I just need, and he's always someone who's higher on the mountain, but yet has time for people that are still beginning to climb it and has invested in my life. And so one of my heroes is here today and I can't wait to, to have all of our freshmen who've never heard him yet maybe uh, be able to hear him. But can we put our hands together for my hero, Dr. Jay Strack. Thanks, man. Man, I want to hear that guy. Uh, sounds like an old guy. Some have been around a long time, uh, which is true. Incredibly cool but yet an old dude, all right? If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to 2 Timothy 1, 7. And I say that because I remember uh, the president got in trouble when he quoted a verse. He said, 2 Corinthians. And everybody said, oh, he doesn't even know. But I remember preaching at First Baptist Dallas, Dr. Criswell, and I said, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. So when you haven't been brought up in evangelical church, there's a lot of things. You know, I would preach uh, out of the book of Job and the book of, so uh, the book of Palms because I was from Florida. So, and, and Nicodemus was Nicodemus. I mean, you know, so I was con as confused as a termite in a yo-yo uh, when I finally began to understand about the seriousness of the Word of God. So I want to share with you, uh, by the way, I've been coming to this mountain since 1973. And uh, so having Dr. Pro Provo, uh, man with his ministry 40 plus years, uh, being so gracious and his friendship with Jerry Falwell. But Jerry Falwell Sr., hear me, and I'm looking you right in the eye, heart to heart, is one of the greatest men I've ever met in my life anywhere in the world. I had hair to my shoulders. I'd been through six broken homes, six foster homes, six detention centers. I dropped out of school twice, had been a junkie, methamphetamine junkie. Uh, literally, uh, you know, when 13 colleges says no thanks, uh, it, the army said we don't need anybody. And that was back when my uncle was going, your uncle wants you, Uncle Sam wants you. And I'd go and they'd say, no, we're good. And uh, then I saw Forrest Gump, <laughs> and they wanted Forrest, but, but anyway, so uh, that just tells you a little bit about, you know, I brought a lot to the dance when I gave my life to the Lord, and I'm being facetious. But I was uh, 17 years old, heard a message too good to be true, and found out it was true, oh so true. And then I found out, guess what, that it's too good to keep to yourself. And so I had still had hair to my shoulders when Jerry Falwell, the fundamentalist, conservative pastor, one of the largest churches uh, in the United States, heard me give my testimony and then saw me witnessing to a guy on the street. And he asked me to come and give my testimony. So I was 19 and a half. Jerry Falwell gave me my very first break. So I've been privileged. I did spiritual emphasis week some 16 times at Liberty. So I've been coming to this mountain for a long, long time. So I'm pumped. And by the way, when I walk around, look at all the buildings and I go, yeah, this is cool. 
I see the stadium. Yeah, this is cool. A lot of assets up here. But I want you to hear me on this. You want to know what the assets are? It's the alumni. It is the thousands and thousands and thousands of young men, young women, who now have been around a while in various places all over the world that started out as young champions for Christ. What a phrase. That doesn't sound sophisticated, doesn't sound suave, doesn't sound even cool, right? Back, but back then, one simple goal, raise up young champions for Christ. And so here I was, this young guy, and this incredible man of God, pastor, big heart, big guy, a bigger heart. Uh, I want you to know, uh, he put his arm around me and opened up doors for me all over the world. In fact, asked me to go with him. I remember Dr. Vernon Brewer and Dr. Falwell and I went to Olympic Village Stadium in Moscow right after uh, things began to open up. We did one of the very first crusades. Dr. Falwell spoke one night. I got to speak one night. So I would be an ingrate if I didn't just take a moment to pay rent to say thank you to someone who God greatly used in my life. So I love this school. And by the way, to know that one of the most anointed, effective young leaders I've ever met is here over spiritual life and spiritual dimensions, David Nasser, uh, he is unbelievable. Now, I got about 20 stories I'll tell you when we go off the air and, you know, it'll kind of humble him. But, beside, but I want you to know, uh, as somebody who's been around a while, God has his hand on him. And I, I just think being here today kind of all comes back to me. So I'm pumped about being on the mountain, but let's get to the good stuff. Let's jump into the Word of God. And by the way, the mountain is being rocked. And by the way, the school is being rocked. And by the way, our nation is being rocked. And I want you to know and understand, the Bible says in the last days, there's going to be a great shaking. So that which is made of man will fall. So that which remains of God will stand. So I want you to know I'm shaken, not stirred, all right? I want you to know I'm one of those that's willing to watch things be shaken. And, you know, I want you to write it down. If you've got a pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara, anything that will write, whatever digital tool you want to use. A Cornell professor said it quite well about a decade ago. He summarized the research in this way. If you listen to an audio presentation, an audio lecture, in other words, you listen. You're not watching it, but you hear a lecture in a classroom, for example, or an auditorium, stadium, whatever. Guess what? He said, you will re if you will remember about 10% of that lecture, but if you listen and take good notes, you can remember up to 80% of what you hear. So I hope you'll get in the habit. You want to be someone who becomes highly effective. You want to be someone that all of a sudden is able to recall certain things. I promise you, harpoon thoughts. When God speaks to you, write it down. If you hear a great quote, write it down. You hear a principle that resonates, write it down. Here's what I like to say. Harpoon that thought on the point of a pencil or it will swim away. All right? And especially somebody like me who was, you know, diagnosed as being ADDD, DDD. I think they added a couple Ds for defect, uh, effect. They said that if I was in the room, I didn't pay attention, and I made disciples, and no one paid attention. And then, of course, I'm very dyslexic. So for a young guy who uh, sees things backwards. And by the way, taking Greek and Hebrew was a lot of fun. But if for someone who has a hard time keeping everything r the way it should be and being able to read, and then, of course, a little ADD on top of that. So I've had to get in the habit when I hear something that I know I'm supposed to internalize. Man, I, I write it down. So I hope you'll 
do that. You know, so right now there's a lot of noise in the system. Let me be Captain Obvious for a moment. There's a lot of noise going on. Now, I live in Orlando, right between NASA and Disney, all right? Pretty fascinating kind of location. Right down the street in Tampa is a place I've been privileged to speak at a couple of times. It's called Central Command. And Central Command is where they monitor and oversee everything that special forces do for the United States anywhere in the world. And they have a phrase. Write this down. I promise this is a keeper. Their phrase is, there's noise in the system. There's noise in the system. So I think it's safe to say, would you agree with me? There's some noise in the system. And we have to now wonder, well, what about what's going on? And how will this affect me? I don't think you're being selfish. I don't think it's immature. I don't think it's something just young people do. Trust me, you've been around a while like me. You know, everything, you look at it. How is this going to affect me? How is this going to affect my family? How is this going to affect my future? I mean, after all, you've made a pretty significant commitment to invest in your future. So with all the noise going on, here's my, my favorite phrase for the moment. Uncertain times with uncertain outcomes. We need some certainties. In uncertain times with uncertain outcomes, we need a sure word. We need something we can take to the bank. We need something that we can hear it and then go, your mama. I mean, there's just something about a personal word that resonates in your heart. It's one of those phrases, for example, that the Bible teaches, hold fast when you hear it. Paul used that to hold fast. So let's talk about some certainties. Life will bring you to your knees. Please know that's a given. Now, I want to tell you, I've been brought to my knees quite a few times in my life. I want to tell you about two quickly. The turning point, really, that began to shape my life in a very negative way happened when I was about eight and a half years old. I'd already gone through, my dad had left when I was six. My mom was forced to give away my older brother. Uh, we bounced around a bit. My mom had several different men in and out of her life. I love my mom. Uh, my mom was, worked two or three jobs, incredible lady. But my mom just could not pick out a good man. I'm just telling you that. I don't know what it was. I remember when it was time for me to get married, she wanted to help me pick out a suit. And I said, Mom, I love you. But picking things out is not your strength, all right? So anyway, but so here I was. I was already gone through a broken home or two, and there were men coming and going uh, in our life. And I never will forget a guy came into our life who said, Jay, I know you don't have a dad. You can call me dad. And he played catch with me. And he had a brand new convertible GTO. Most of you don't know what that is, but trust me, that's a your mama moment, all right? A convertible blue GTO. And, and, and so I could say to the kids in the neighborhood, I've got a dad. Because from somebody where the police were called and, you know, everybody in the neighborhood knew it and all the fights and all the embarrassment, all of a sudden I felt like, man, I have it. But yet... Inevitably, some six months later, my mom comes home weeping, sobbing, and says, Jay, we're going to drive to Fort Myers Beach, and if Bob doesn't come home, he's at a bar, if he doesn't come home, I can't take it anymore, it's over. We drove to Fort Myers Beach, Fort Myers, Florida, on the Gulf, and uh, it was a rainy night, and I sat there in the car watching the light flash on and off, on and off. Fun times at the surf club. Fun times at the surf club. And you know, all the liquor commercials, all the beer commercials, you notice them. Man, they look like professional models. The bar looks like paradise. You know, the wind's blowing, the hair, you know. And uh, all these things are going on, right? But guess what? And everybody looks like a model. Everybody is a tent. The bar I went into that night, hello, was nothing like that. 
I mean, I bet there were eight teeth in the whole room. But, beside, but the beer commercials make the scene look awfully good. All right? The devil specializes in putting glitter all over junk. All right? But I went into that bar because my mom came out a few moments later, sat in the rain on the steps, and wept. Now, I'm eight or nine. I don't know about being bad to the bone and tough and cool. I just know that's my mom, and this guy promised to be my dad. I went into that bar, and there were just a handful in there, and it was nasty. And I went in, and he saw me. He said, Jay, what are you doing here? I said, you promised to be my dad. Would you come home and be my dad? And I never will forget, other men in the bar began to kind of make fun. I found out peer pressure is not just for young men when we worry about what other guys say or young, lady, young ladies when you worry about what you... I found out adults can be affected by peer pressure because some of the men in that bar started going, Bob, will you come home and be with me? And, Bob, and you know, so Bob kind of, that made him even more belligerent. And I never will forget, he said, I tell you what, Jay, if you get on your knees and beg me to come home, I'll come home and be your dad. Now, guys, I got on my knees. I'll never forget, I can still remember as though it was yesterday, how sticky that barroom floor was. And I looked up and I said, please come home and be my dad. And I watched this man laugh at me. And I watched all the other men in that bar laugh at me. And I got up off that sticky barroom floor and the light went out inside me. The light went out. Now, when I said life has a way of bringing you to your knees, and by the way, do you know every time I speak in a prison, anytime I speak in a county jail or a state prison or a drug, alcohol rehab center, whatever it may be, I always ask one question. Do you remember when the light went out? Do you remember when the light went out? And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you why you and I hold fast to the Word of God, why we're not going to be affected by all the noise in the system, why we're going to stay true and faithful and stand and hold fast is because we have millions of people in our country, billions in the world, where the light has gone out. I remember, and by the way, I've never had anyone in that setting not be able to say, I remember when the light went out. So one time, life brought me to my knees. The second time is when the light came back on. 17 years old hair to my waist, track marks up and down my arms, behind the back of my knees. And you know when, uh, and I just lost one of my closest friend, horrible accident, uh, didn't make it home. I stood over his grave and promised I'd never get high again and hours later right back to it, you know. But I went to a Bible study at the age of 17. I was wearing a Budweiser shirt and somebody said, you can't wear a Budweiser, you're going to a church thing. So I just took the shirt off, went in without a shirt. I mean, you know, hello. And uh, it was Florida and shorts and sandals, no socks, by the way. But uh, anyway, so I go into this Bible study, and I heard the message of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion, my dating life, my, my uh, uh, weekend life, my drug life, where the spikes just literally being driven through the hands and feet of Jesus. I got arrested. I got busted for the death of Jesus that night. I found out he died for me. I was on his mind. And that night they made an opportunity. So I had a moment where I was on my knees again, only this time, guess what? The light came on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I was 17. That was uh, 50 plus years ago. I'm telling you, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And he's as real today as he was that night. Went home, flushed the drugs, flushed the booze. All the rats were high in the sewer for months. But anyway, and you know what I found out? I not only needed a savior, I needed a deliverer. So 
Life is going to bring you to your knees. Do you believe that? You've already maybe, some of us may have already had a moment or two. And then things are going to happen where we get a little disillusioned and a little angry and a little put, you know, we go, I don't, I don't know. But listen to me. You have to capture your future. You have to capture your future. The easiest way, this is worth keeping right here, the easiest way to be defeated is to be distracted. I want you to keep your eyes and your glaze on Jesus. No noise in the system. And when Jesus comes in, he comes to stay. He's not just Savior, he's Deliverer. So the, I know what it's like to be abandoned. I know what it's like to be physically abused, sexually abused, uh, verbally uh, abused. I know what it's like to give in to anger. I know what it's like to have a life dominated by addiction. So I'm just here to tell you, he is the deliverer. And when you know him, we can't let anything or anyone keep us from doing what we were saved to do and called to do. One of the, so that's a couple of certainties. Uncertain times, life will bring you to your knees. What we do on our knees determine now what? What's next? And then stand up. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. I want you to circle this. I want you to make this a verse you'll camp out in. The Bible says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but He's given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, what does that mean, the spirit of fear? It's the spirit of cowardness. You know what fear does? It paralyzes us. You know what it does? It overwhelms us. You know what it does? It makes us, you know, really not willing to have anybody ask us a hard question. We become fearful. Fear, that great definition of fear, false evidence that appears real. And, you know, I want you to know that's why if the Bible says, if, fear the Lord, respect the Lord, because he'll cast out every other fear. So I want you to know and understand as a young guy that's been from the gangs to the detention centers to dropping out, 13 colleges saying no thanks, finally getting in on what's called academic probation. A couple of you know what I mean on that. But anyway, I want you to know I ended up getting through four years and two years and five months. And I ended up getting a master's degree and a doctor's degree. And I, again, the only talent I had was a big mouth. So I've been able to speak and share with people all over the world. So God will finish what he starts in us. Hear me. 50 years ago, a young junkie was delivered. And I'm telling you, he is so real and so powerful. You know, it also says in 2 Timothy, and the Lord grant to him, right? The Lord grant to him that you would not be ashamed. Paul says, For I know in whom I have believed, I am persuaded he's able to keep me that which I have committed to him until the day he comes back. And there's going to be a day, I believe soon, when he blows the whistle and says everybody out of the pool. All right? So I want to be faithful until the whistle gets blown and the Lord says it's over. And by the way, you want to make sure you're dressed right. You don't want to be in one of these little skimpy things when the whistle blows and you get out of the pool, right? So we want to be living right. Just a thought. Just wanted to share that with you because I'm a scholar, as you can tell. All right. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, God says that we have not been given a spirit of fear. Can I share with you one of my favorite definitions of courage? Courage is the ability to face reality. Courage is the ability to face reality. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but rather of power. Now that word power literally translated means ability. What does it mean God will give you power? The night I got on and ask him to step out of heaven and step into my heart. And I went home that night and I flushed all the drugs and I had to go through withdrawal. And by the way, I'd quit 20 times before that, but I never could stay quit. 
God did something for me. Do you know what the word? He gave me power. You know what the power means? The word power means? The ability. You see, I need God's power. Every day there's new challenges. Every day there's new pressures. Every day there's new fears. Every day, you know, you just look around, look what your last month's been like, right? So please understand, God says, I'm going to give you power. What does that mean? Ability. Well, for what? Whatever needs done that day. I don't need deliverance power from methamphetamine. I don't need it from meth crystal. I don't need it from Coke. I don't need it from that. But guess what? There are other things that come up in my life. And you know, have you ever noticed with temptations and distractions and certain things that appeal to us and begin to kind of crawl into our lives? Can I share with you one of the greatest spiritual lessons I've ever learned in my life? It's that story of Moses standing in front of Pharaoh. And it began really in the desert. You remember when God was calling Moses and he was very reluctant? And he said, Moses, throw your rod down. And he threw the rod down. It turned into a snake. You remember that story? Well, now all of a sudden, God tells him, go see Pharaoh, most powerful man in the history of the world at that time. And he walks in and God says, tell him, let my people go. And Pharaoh laughed and said, no. Oh, let me get this straight. You want me to let the people go? Uh, No. And the Lord said, Moses, throw your rod down. Moses threw it down and it turns into a snake. And you can just hear Moses. That's what I'm talking about. You check that out, Moses. I told you. God said, let the people go. And then all of a sudden, Pharaoh called. You know what happened. All his magicians, sorcerers, etc. We don't know if there were 20 or 100. We don't know. But every one of them threw their rods down, and they all turned into serpents. And so the Lord says, Moses, throw your rod back down. And you can just hear Moses, right, using some of that imagination, uh, you know, that, that some of us have, uh, you know, been hearing about. But guess what? When you go to throw that rod down, Moses is being told, throw it down. He's thinking, Lord, I don't know if you can see with the columns and the drapes and everything, but there's like a hundred serpents up there. Everybody's doing throw the rod down. It's not working like it was just me and you in the desert. Moses, throw it down. Now, what kind of story is that about the rods all turning into snakes? That's either a weird, quirky little story. Maybe that's been added by Stephen King. I mean, somebody like that. Where in the world does that come from and what's the purpose of it? Here's the purpose. I believe, because when Moses threw that rod back down, what happened? That serpent consumed all the other serpents. So I just want to challenge you. If I'll make Jesus... The single greatest passion in my life. And do it day in and day out. And day in and day out and day in and day out until there are no more days. But if I'll make Jesus the greatest passion in my life, guess what? He'll consume any other passion that raises its head in my life. Now, please remember Some good people are making mistakes. Some good people have gotten careless. Some good people have been living all kinds of different lives. You know them. They're in your family. They're in your friends. They're at school. I mean, we know this stuff is going on. But guess what? If you'll make Jesus the great passion of your life, he'll keep you from doing that. you got to remember, and please write this down, That which we do in secret will be shouted from the housetop. That which you and I think we can hide and cover up is going to be revealed publicly. So I just want you to know from somebody that is capable of having passions and thoughts and temptations and weaknesses, I'm just telling you, Brother to brother, 
brother to sister. Make him your great passion. I promise you. So far, by the grace of God, and Lord, take me home before I ever let you down, let my family down. My, but I just want you to know, I can live a victorious, dynamic, exciting life because God had not given me the spirit of fear. He's given me the ability, the power, uh, love, and a sound mind. And by the way, you know what the word sound mind means? Literally means a courageously clean conscience. And God will give you the courage to face reality. I've had a daughter that had to go through many, many surgeries and still struggles and has to work twice as hard as most folks have to, to just try to keep up. And somehow, some way, with all those medical bills and all the, guess what God has provided? He has been there. So life can bring you to your knees. You can face challenges loved ones and illness and disappointments. So simply put, understand when God gives you the spirit of power and love and of sound mind, you walk out believing there's always a way. Another great principle is learn to feel your muscle, not your pulse. Feel your muscle, not your pulse. Your pulse comes and goes. You ever notice some days you don't have any energy, and some days you're hyper. Some days you feel like a million dollars. Some days you feel like eight cents. Some days you sleep through the night and wake up feeling great. Some days you couldn't sleep at all and you're in a coma. Guess what? Don't go through life letting your pulse rule your life. Because some people always, it's how I feel. I'm not feeling good. My feelings, my feelings. Sometimes my pulse is so weak and I don't have any energy. I feel like, man, I've been dead for a week and I didn't even know it. I mean, I can't find a pulse. And then there's other times, what? That your pulse races out of control. So what I've learned is go through life. Whenever you hear something, there's a challenge. You, it, something's difficult. Something's even overwhelming. Learn to feel your muscle, not your pulse. And your muscle are the certainties that God has shown you. Your muscle are the spiritual muscles you've developed as you've lived uh, victoriously. So feel your muscle, not your pulse. Believe there's always a way. And please remember, private victories precede public victories. Private victories precede public victories. You want the Lord to honor your life? You want the Lord to give you fruit? You want the Lord to give you influence? And you know, everybody wants, and I'm privileged, we get to work on student leadership university and and all over the world, and I get to teach leadership uh, to Fortune 100 companies and teams and a military academy. I get to do un things I can't even comprehend. Can I tell you something about leadership? If you can't lead you, you'll never really be able to lead anyone else. And if you can't motivate you, you'll never be able to motivate anyone else. And you know where the word motivation comes from? Motive. What makes you tick? What's your motive? Now, I want to be liked. I want to be popular. I want to be cool. I want to be all those things. I want to do well. I want to be respected. I want to provide for my family and children and grandchildren. I want to be able to help people around. I, I've got a lot of want-tos. But please hear me when I share with you. If you want God to bless you publicly, you want God to give you fruit and influence. And by the way, the one word definition for leadership is what? One word, influence. It's not a title, not a position, not a flow chart, according to Maxwell. It's what? It's influence. When you can influence another human being. You want to capture your future? Please write this down. Capture the moment. I've spent my life worried about the next big thing. David's been a 
part of that. And uh, you'll hear a guy soon named Dr. Uh, Brent Crow, and he's been a part of that. And we've done some incredible, exciting, unbelievable things together. And then, by the way, I know, I know that God's going to use them in their life, and they'll do a hundredfold more than I ever did. And I rejoice knowing that. But I just want you to understand, and I, and, and I hope you, you, you get it, that uh, if I have a pure motive and I'm willing to sacrifice for other people, and if I'm not just worried about the next big thing for me, but I'm just going to capture the moment, can I be real straight with you? I'm honored to be back at Liberty. And I realize it's not the Convo Center jam-packed and, you know, that moment. But guess what? Even if it wasn't being shown to so many students, I'd be honored. I would feel like being with you in this room is important. It's a big deal. And by the way, the young man who has been serving and helping and so gracious hosting us, uh, I, and I watch so many of you working so hard here in the, in the studio. Get, you know what? Listen to me. You are the key. So if I capture the moment, I believe maybe when I drove up, I'm coming to Liberty, and I'm going to get a bunch of great opportunities while here at Liberty, and then I'm going to D.C. and be there in D.C. again. But guess what? It may have been the valet when I pulled into the airport at 5.55 yesterday morning, it may have been my 10 minutes with the valet that is the most important thing I did. Not chapel, not convo, not a leadership session. Guess what? Capture the moment. If I get the moment right, I promise you, I'll be able to capture the future. You string together moments. And you know, some of us worry more about meeting the person on stage than we do each other. Do you know the most impressive people I know that people ooh and awe about? I've known them for 30 or 40 years. You know that person? Yeah, I knew them before they were anybody. And guess what? None of us were anybody back then, uh, you know. And by the way, you know, I, I knew Maxwell, for example. Look at John Maxwell. There. Everybody quotes John Maxwell. I knew John Maxwell before he was John Maxwell. I think I'm a better leader than John Maxwell. Look at where John Maxwell is after he met me. And then I'm here, and I've done well. But since I met John, you know, he met me. He's here. I met him. So I'm just thinking. I must be a better leader. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, look at what happens. So, but please don't worry about the guy on stage, the person on stage. When you've got some teammates, some of you that are in the collective together, and some of you that are on certain committees and groups together, and you have responsibility, and some of you are going to go on to rock the planet. So just the ability to build meaningful, lasting relationships is the single greatest leadership skill you can possess. So I close with this. Do you have a resilient faith? Can you feel pressure and then be able to get back to your normal position? Resiliency. To rebound to get up, to take it, to say, man, Lord, that was tough, but thank you that I'm back up. I mean, you want to, don't settle. Don't settle. Eagles never settle. They always soar. Be an eagle. Have resilient faith that whatever life comes, if God be for me, who can be against me? And I've seen that all over the world for 50 years. So Liberty University, I can't wait to see. I know the alumni, not every one of them, but I've been around long. I know unbelievable contribution Liberty 
students have made around the world. And guess what? Those that have been around a while will put this group up against any other class. So let's be eagles. Let's ask God give us a resilient faith. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, if you're for us, help us to know no one or no thing can be against us. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And Lord, we're a bunch of nobodies that met somebody who happened to be the creator and the Savior and the Lord of glory. And Lord Jesus, we just make a manger in our heart when we ask you to be born in us those years ago. Help us to know that we know that we know. Help us to live a life of resilient faith that yes, we hurt. Yes, we can get discouraged. Yes, we get tired. Yes, we can even be grieved. But Lord, help us to realize that you have a plan and a purpose for us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Can we thank Dr. J one more time? What a great word. Thank you, sir. Now you know why he's one of my absolute heroes of the world. Uh, before we leave, just want to make two quick announcements. If you are interested again in going abroad with Liberty University, all you need to do for a first initial step is just to text L U A broad, all right, L, you know, L-U abroad uh, to 24502, and that'll get you the first initial contact to go set up a meeting in Green Hall, L-U sends offices uh, on the second floor there. Also, campus community next week will be at 630, so we're going back to our original time. That'll be a little bit warmer as the weather's getting colder, and also kind of readjust us in being able to enjoy the sunset since it's getting earlier and earlier uh, here in the fall. And so tickets open up for that on Monday morning. They're always quickly taken. So set that in your calendar, grab your tickets and join us for Campus Community. Know that we love you. We're here for you. If you need anything, our counseling office at L.U. Shepherds is always open on the hill. God bless you. Have a great weekend.